Books make you hope. Books make you dream. Books make you laugh. Books make you scream. This is the Books That Make You Show. Discussing books with authors and experts, unraveling the inner pages of all the books that help make us who we are. Hosted by Desiree Duffy. Welcome, everybody. My name's Desiree Duffy, and it's time for the Books That Make You Show. And today, we're deviating a little bit from what we usually do, because we're going to talk about books that make you help other writers become authors. Yeah, every author has a dream of success, of signing with a publisher, of being a bestseller, of captivating millions with their stories, and of living that that lifestyle of being a prolific writer. Few really achieve that status though. And even fewer still turn around and help other writers to realize their dreams. But our guest today is William Bernhardt and that's exactly what he does. Now, William Bernhardt is the author of over 50 different books. So that's what I mean about this show being different. We can't just focus on one book. We're focusing on everything William does. It's amazing. Now, most recently, he has the Daniel Pike legal thriller series. um, And that's starting with the number one bestselling novel, The Last Chance Lawyer. His previous works include the bestselling Ben Kincaid series, the historical novels, Challengers of the Dust and Nemesis, two books of poetry, The White Bird and The Ocean's Ed, Edge, as well as the Red Sneaker books on fiction and on writing. Um, In addition, William has founded the Red Sneaker Writers Con Center, I should say, to mentor aspiring writers. And the center hosts the annual Writers Con, Writer Con, Mm -hmm. it's it's called. Um, And then he has small group writing retreats, bi weekly newsletter. He does a podcast. You do it all, William. How, How the heck do you do all of that? That's amazing. Well, I, I prefer to stay busy. It's really better. <laughs> Give me something to do. <laughs> so, okay. I, I want to start with, you, you've written over 50 books. and 55, from, I think. 55. Okay. It's I possible might possible I've lost track at this point, but <laughs> I think that's right. All right. And we're going to talk about Splitsville. That's your most recent one, cool. but I want to, I want to save that until later on. Okay. First, let's start with just this idea that once you've achieved a certain level of success, you're now turning around and giving back. I love that idea just in general in life. So let's talk about why you decided after achieving so many successes that you've started to help or are helping, I should say, other writers. Mm -hmm. Well, I know how hard it is to get started and the world has changed a great deal since I was trying to launch my writing career. But I'm not sure it's gotten much easier. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, and I knew from a very early age that I wanted to be a writer. But, (laughs) you know, writing is one thing. How do you make that happen? There were no writers in my town, I am pretty sure. (laughs) And nobody seemed to know much about it. Everybody seemed to think that was a, you know, pie in the sky pipe dream. Uh, But I was pretty determined. And eventually, obviously, I figured it out and made my way in the writing world. But I thought it might be nice if I could uh, provide a step up for the next generation and maybe have some way of conveying the information it took me many, many years to learn. Yeah, and that's so valuable. I myself work with a lot of authors and writers, too. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you're from a small town, it, it, you, you know, it's like you're, you're that great American novelist, right? They're usually okay. from a small town. But right. how do you feel nowadays with the Internet and connectivity mm-hmm. and being able to really reach so many authors? I mean, you don't have to live in a big city. You don't have to be in New York in order to be a writer nowadays. That's exactly right. I'm not sure you ever did. I certainly never did. But it's clear that with the internet, as you mentioned, and uh, the dominance of Amazon and the book sales marketplace, and uh, the ability of authors to reach their readers directly, uh, uh, there are many paths now to writing success that did not get didn't, didn't, didn't exist then. You know, when I was starting out trying in the late 80s or so, 
uh, there was one way to be published, basically, if if you wanted to get anywhere with it. The place where books sold were bookstores. And if you wanted to get in bookstores, you needed a publisher, the bigger, the better, which meant you needed an agent. And, you know, these weren't things to think about. These were givens. And I was for- fortunate, although it took forever. I eventually found an agent and got a deal with Random House. And, uh, you know, my first book was published in 91. Now, of course, it's a completely different landscape and authors have many more options than they did before, which doesn't necessarily make it easier, but it gives you the opportunity to choose, which I think is a wonderful thing because I'm all about the author. Anything that makes the world better or fairer for authors, I'm all for it. Yeah, exactly. And you nailed it. There's so many options today that weren't there. Um, I remember... Um, probably about 15 years ago, I was working in radio and Howard Rosenberg, who was the TV critic for the LA Times, and he's an author, he was about ready to be at the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. And I asked him for advice, because at that point in time, self publishing was just starting to bubble up. And he's like, Mm -hmm. don't you dare self publish. That's the equivalent of doing porn. (laughs) And now I look back and I think, but so many authors have self-published. You're right. There's so many options that are out there. So if you wouldn't mind, maybe just giving mm-hmm. everybody an overview of what 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 some of those options are in the self-publishing world, too. Well, he may have been a little poor, uh, a little harsh uh, comparing it to the poor. I don't think it's quite that. But, you know, it's not that it's something uh, immoral or degrading. It's that there was no way to succeed with it once upon a time because books sold in brick and mortar bookstores. And you could have the most wonderful book in the world and self-publish it. Uh, and it's not going to go. Uh, uh, John Grisham would be a great example. First book is essentially self-published. He had an alliance with a, s- a small press, but he's selling it out of the back of his car. And though it's a fine novel, it doesn't go anywhere. Second book is at Doubleday and the firm takes off like a rocket. Uh, there was just no way to be successful and to reach your audience before the pivot in basically 2009. Ebooks had existed a little bit before that, and Amazon certainly had, but that was when the first successful e-readers came out and people started reading ebooks, and Amazon had its KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing program, and suddenly what was not viable before became completely viable, not easy. I caution anybody who's watching this, I'm not saying it's a, a, you know, a walk in the park. Most people self-publish their works, you know, are not financially successful, but there are some who really work it, treat it like a business, spend as much or more time marketing as they do writing, and they have been able to make it successful. We've got, according to Amazon's annual report, more than a thousand people now making six digit figures annually self-publishing their work. Now that's a thousand out of probably a million, but still the point is it's possible. Yeah, it is possible more so, like you said, than ever before. And, And sometimes too, I mean, I work with a lot of authors as well, and it really depends upon what their goals are. Because if you really want to get the writing out there, and maybe money isn't necessarily the thing that's incentivizing you, you can do it. Unlike, again, 20 years ago, you could do it, but then it, they even called them vanity press. You had, a, had that label put on it, like you're, you're just kind of putting something out there that's never going to be read. So it, it's so cool that those opportunities are now sure. available. Well, vanity presses are people you pay to publish your book, and they still exist. So buyer beware. If you're with a publishing house that wants you to pay money, I don't care what they call it, a publishing fee or a marketing fee or anything else, don't do it. You might as well self-publish. You would be better off than paying those outfits to publish your book. But when people self-publish in previous years, well, you'd have to have it offset printed in paper, probably get a minimum of a thousand, more typically 5,000 and 4,985 of those are going to sit in your garage until the end of time. Because after you've given one to your mom and all your friends, there's no way to sell them. But today there is. And you mentioned the internet. Some of the ways of marketing books on on the internet work very well. 
Uh, I know there are people who don't want to spend all day on social media talking about themselves or the books, and I get that. But, you know, take it from me. Uh, it's a lot more effective than some of the things people did in the past with book tours and book signings where you sit at a table for two hours drumming your fingers or uh, being shuttled from city to city. I, I just got to say, I don't want to sound ingrateful, but if a book tour sounds glamorous to you, that just tells me you've never done it. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it was that productive in terms of spurring sales either somewhat, but uh, didn't really justify the cost, but social media may be irritating, but it's free and it does in fact build audiences. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. And again, it goes back to people have this idea, this dream of being a writer, sitting right. at the desk with the stack of books, signing autographs at the local bookstore. Once you do that a couple of times, yeah, it's not so glamorous anymore, but it's a, a dream come true for many. Right. Well, and the, the line of books, you know, sure, Neil Gaiman might get that. But <laughs> most people, even very well-known and successful people, don't have that experience in part because they tend to be poorly publicized. But anyway, that's a whole different problem. That is. That is. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, too, it seems that the quote unquote old vanity presses are now calling themselves hybrid publishers. And it seems there, there are some good ones out there, too, as well as some not so good ones. So I just wanted to say the IBPA, their Independent Book Publishers Association, does have a document. If you go to their website, Independent Book Publishers Association, that kind of gives you pros and cons of hybrid publishing. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted to throw that out there so people have a, a resource for that. But piggybacking with everything that we're talking about, can William, can you tell us a little bit more detail about Red Sneaker Books? Mm -hmm. Red, bo red, red, I, sorry, it's a tongue twister for me. Red Sneaker <laughs> Center. Can you tell us more about that? Red Sneaker Writers. Center. There you go. Okay. And the, the trick is where do you put the S? Don't feel bad. I get it wrong all the time, too. <laughs> that really started. I was teaching programs and I thought as I was repeating myself, you know, for the third or eighth or 20th time, I ought to have a book. You know, there ought to be like a text. And I knew there were other writing books, but I didn't love any of them. I thought they tended to be too long and repetitive and you know, include excerpts really just because they're padding <laughs> to the word length that Writer's Digest press once or whatever. And so I thought, okay, I'll just write my own to use in these classes. And then once I had the books, I thought, well, uh, might as well put them up on the internet too. I, I should mention at this point that I also have a publishing house, but we could get to that in a minute. And then they started taking off. And then almost on a whim, because my wife records audiobooks, I thought, well, I'll just sit down and record one of those. And that's when the books really took off as audiobooks, because they're all relatively short. I will not waste anybody's times, time. I get, down, I get to the point, you know, this is what you need to know to write a good book <laughs> and boil it down. You've all read. You can come up with your own examples. Here is what you need to do. And so they were relatively inexpensive because they're maybe three hours long. And people, of course, freed from CDs and cassette tapes could just download them directly to their phone and listen to it when they're commuting to work. And those really took off. And so anyway, I uh, finally ended up doing 10 of those. And I thought, OK, 10 enough. I've covered it now. But every now and then I think maybe there should be another one. But probably 10 is enough. And that led to the small group writing retreats. I just finished one in WriterCon. Uh, in in Eureka Springs, but as you know, WriterCon, the annual writing convention, is just around the corner, Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma City. But and here's the great thing, at least for some of you who may not be living in Oklahoma or nearby, if you don't want to travel right now, you don't have to because the whole conference is streamed. You can watch it from home if you want, and all the sessions will remain online for an for a month afterwards. So even if you, you know, don't want to watch them live, you've got an op. You could theoretically watch more than the people on the ground can watch because they can't be more than one place at the same time, but you could. Yeah. That's the thing about conferences. There's usually a couple of different tracks and there's things going on. You can't possibly right. see it all. So it's great that you're offering uh, that online and I'll be there. I'm excited to be there yeah. in Oklahoma city with you. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, you, you hinted at your publishing company. So mm -hmm. let's circle back to that. Tell us about that. 
Well, this is something uh, that that I've been doing small scale for a while, but during the lockdown, uh, I have three kids and I mean, we call them kids. They're all grown up now. But uh, when the pandemic hit, Alice had just gotten out of college and Ralph was in his first year at college, but sent home, you know, because they were closing the dorms and doing everything virtually. My other son, who was getting ready to go overseas, had to cancel that. And so I thought, oh, let's just, uh, you know, have a project we all work on together since we're stuck at home. And we greatly expanded this publishing house and started taking on other writers. Alice is the editor in chief and Ralph is the marketing director. And Harry is the finance guy because he's the only one who really can add and subtract, uh, (laughs) at least better than me. The other kids probably could, but I can't. And that's worked out wonderfully well. We've got uh, several hundred titles in print now, and some of them are doing very well. Oh, excellent. Excellent. So let's let's jog over and talk more specifically about your fiction writing Mm -hmm. then um you have several series and i know we have splitsville that that's been recently released but i like your chalk version of the cover better that is cool (laughs) oh talented they're 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 fun to draw so tell us what's going on with splitsville it's a legal thriller give us the lowdown well, you mentioned the Daniel Pike books, and I've done six of those and, and thought it was time to pause. I had kind of conceived it as a six-book story arc. I, each book tells its own story. It's not, you know, the Lord of the Rings. It's not a to-be-continued each time. But there is a larger story arc that I thought, uh, you know, this is a good place to hit pause after six. I had done the same thing when I started writing books at Random House back in 91, the first book. I had a young attorney called Ben Kincaid, and he proved so popular, I did 19 of them. Although, again, in my mind, it was a six-book thing, but uh, Random House kept wanting more, and it really went on to a point that I thought, okay, I got to do something else for a while, or I'm going to go nuts. So 10 years off doing some of the other books that you mentioned, the historical novels and a young adult book, two books of poetry, a children's book. And eventually thought it was time to circle back to my roots, these legal thrillers. Enough time had passed and enough new was going on in the world that I was seeing possibilities for new series and did six of those. And now it's Splitsville, which has a female protagonist, Kinsey Rivera, who is initially a divorce attorney. It's a, it's a divorce firm, very successful, uh, but because, Because they handle principally divorce, they're known around town as Splitsville. That's where the title comes from. But as you probably guessed, this being one of my books, she soon gets involved in something way worse. (laughs) As if divorce weren't bad enough, uh, there's all kinds of murder and mayhem, and she has to up her game and take risks like she's never taken before. And that's what the first book is about, and it uh, seemed to take off well. So now I've got a sequel coming out in the fall which will be called, are you ready for it? I'm not sure I've said this in public before. It's going to be called Exposed. Oh, nice, nice. Now, is this series going to be about a six-book series too? How That's what I'm you- thinking. I mean, you know, you should never write these things in stone because who knows, if I have this brilliant idea for a seventh or an eighth or think I'm tired of it after five, then whatever. But that's that's kind of what I'm thinking, yes. Six of those, and then maybe move on to something else. My son, Ralph, thinks wants me to do a crossover novel, you know, like they do in, in, in comics, like the Avengers movies where 20 different... He wants me to bring in all the heroes from all the books, all 55, I guess, and have them all team up in one book. And <laughs> that sounds very ambitious. Maybe someday. <laughs> That's very ambitious. Yeah. So, okay, I got to ask you, I mean, when, when you're writing a standalone book, like I could read Splitsville, Splitsville and it's a standalone, right? I'm going to be satisfied mm-hmm. at the end. So when you're planning a series that has multiple books like that, and then you're not quite sure are you going, is it that old adage where you're driving and you can the headlights mm-hmm. are on and you can see so far ahead of you? And that's fine because you keep driving or do you plot this out? Are you Mm. pantsing or plotting more so? Because are you kind of developing all these arcs and all these storylines and everything in Mm. some kind of a large series Bible? 
Yeah, I'm a planner and I don't, or a plotter, if you will. Uh, but I've just found, oh, I, I've done it all ways. And I've just found that that's more productive. You get a better book and in somewhat less time, not that it's ever going to be fast, but less uh, messing around and writing things that get cut if you think this out in advance. And I would particularly encourage people who are thinking about writing series characters, which is you know, kind of what they're looking for these days, particularly in New York. Uh, if you have the idea that the New York publishers are all publishing like serious literary fiction, I hate to, <laughs> I hate to be the t bearer of b bad tidings, but that's such a small percentage of what's coming out of New York right now. Whether they call it genre fiction or upscale fiction, it's mostly genre fiction, popular fiction with series characters, that is their bread and butter. So it's a good time. Uh, but I would advise you to think about it in advance, try and tool a character who, for instance, has a reason for butting into other people's business, <laughs> like a lawyer or a doctor or a police officer or a PI or something like that. Someone who has a reason to be taking case after case and think about the character because you want him to appeal to your readers at more so than I think in any other kind of fiction. This is important because I mean, really, why would people be tuning in for the 18th Ben Kincaid book? Surely it's not because they're, you know, desperate to see another murder or <laughs> go into the courtroom. They like the character. That's what brings people back. They like him and whether the plot interests them or not, they want to see what this guy's up to. And so you need to come up with a character who's interesting, who has some kind of special skills, maybe a little quirky, maybe passionate about something. Uh, these are the things that I think make characters interesting and make readers want to come back book after book. Yeah, and you touched on something that's just so important. And this whole idea that someone's lit one book, their literary opus that they've decided mm -hmm. to pen or their memoir. And I love memoirs. Trust me, I do. But the idea that that's got a commercial aspect to it. So many authors are disappointed. Right. So I think it kind of goes back to decide what you want. Do you want to put your opus out there and realize that it's probably not going to have commercial value? Or are you creating something that has legs? Because mm -hmm. those publishers in New York, just like any company, if you go to Nike and you say, I have one pair of shoes, and they mm -hmm. say, oh, we love this pair of shoes. Can you give us more shoes? We want to create an entire line. And you said, no, it's just this one pair of shoes. That's not marketable. So I think that's what it boils down to. If you have, like you said, that character that can come back again and again, think Tomb Raider, Laura Croft, think 007, mm. think, you know, right. your characters as well. They just keep giving and giving. So Tell me, William, what, what, what is the piece of advice that you have that you feel is the most important for today's writers to know? What would you like to say to them? Well, I encourage people uh, to commit to a regular writing schedule because it is so easy to put off writing uh, because there's always other stuff. You probably got a day job or you're raising children or both and or a million. Other, I mean, when you should be writing doing the laundry seems really important. You know, I'll just do that first and then I'll do, and you end up not writing at all. I try and get people to sign a contract. There's one in the first, in the back of the first of those red sneaker books, story structure, sign a contract saying I'm going to write. And this is going to depend on your schedule, but push it, you know, make yourself write every day if possible, or if that's not possible, then commit to Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, two hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day, whatever you can do, and then sign the contract so it's legally binding. <laughs> Get other people in the family to sign it so they'll understand to leave you alone when you're trying to get your writing work done and then stick to that schedule. I mean, even if you can only turn out a couple pages a day, uh, if you just do it every day, you'll have a first draft in maybe three months or so. And then you can start revising and revising and each successive revision should take a little bit less, a little bit at least. And that's how you get to finishing that first book. You cannot be published unless you finish the first book. So that's what I recommend. 
That's great advice. And with November coming up a couple months away, do you mm-hmm. recommend that authors do things like NaNoWriMo where they are under a 30-day guise mm-hmm. to to vomit out a, no- a novel? Right. Is that a, a good strategy in your opinion? You know, it's it's hard for me to believe anybody could write a good book in 30 days. I assume that that means try and get a first draft done in first in 30 days. And if Nano Rhino helps you get your rear end in the chair and ride on a regular basis, then great. Of course, every month could be Nano Rhino month. You just need to decide and commit to doing it. And uh, sure, if that helps, go for it. What you need to do is make yourself write regularly and get that first book finished. Yeah, yeah. How, how many words do you put out a day? I don't think there is any consistency. And honestly, I've never even uh, tried to. I tend to see the thing more in terms of uh, uh scenes, really. I mean, it used to be word processors didn't even tell me the word count they do now, but they didn't used to. They used to tell you what page you're on. And so I paid more attention to that, knowing how many pages this book needed to be approximately to be published. But, you know, in today's world, even that's going out the window. The whole idea that a book has to be at least 80,000 words or, uh, you know, 100,000 words to be an epic. That all had to do with traditional publishing and paper and how thick it needed to be so that the spine could have words on it. And, uh, you know, with with a world that's predominantly ebook, that doesn't that's not even relevant anymore. Absolutely. Okay. What I, I know we've got WriterCon coming mm-hmm. up. And- WriterCon is Labor Day weekend. That's September 3rd through 6th in Oklahoma City or stream from home. And it is not too late to register. Go to the website, which is writercon.org, W R I T E R C O N. Dot org. We're going to have more than 60 presenters, more than 80 sessions, plus you can meet agents and editors and inner contests. I mean, there is something for you, I guarantee, something to help you take your writing up to the next level. Yeah, you really have a lot going on. And if you wouldn't mind just explaining, especially mm-hmm. for novice writers or somebody who might have never gone to a writer's con- conference before, you have agents who are there right. that people can actually pitch to. And I think that's one of the greatest benefits of that in-person writer's conference. Can you talk about that really mm-hmm. quick? Well, getting an agent is always tough, but let's face it, if you can meet them in person, your odds go up about a thousand fold uh, if you're just randomly sending out email queries. I have seen people at WriterCon. I'm not guaranteeing this will happen to anyone, but I've seen people literally get an agent on the spot. Like they start their pitch and somebody says, I want that, you know, or maybe they'll say, send me the manuscript and it happens a week later. But the point is, this is the best way there is to get an agent. Or if you want to go the other route, you want to self-publish, great, but you're going to need a lot of information to make that work. This is where you get the information. Yeah, absolutely. And you have a couple of dozen authors under your belt that you've helped in some way or another, either get that agent or get that publishing deal. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's got to feel great. Okay. William, really quick. Can you tell people where they can find you online, your website, where they can find Splitsville Mm -hmm. and more information about WriterCon? Thanks. I think you can find Splitsville wherever you buy books. I think it's everywhere in uh, print, ebook, and audio. Uh, my website is williambernhardt.com. Couldn't be any easier than that. And as I said, if you want more information about WriterCon, that's writercon.org. Perfect. William Bernhardt, you're a renaissance man. I, I can't even describe you in one sentence. You're an author, a writer, you're a publisher. You're the director of WriterCon. You do so much for the writing community. Thank you for being here today on the Books That Make You Show. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. My pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Please take a look at our website. It's booksthatmakeyou.com. And you can sign up for our newsletter there and find out what's going on in the world of books and authors. As well, follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, And of course, YouTube. Make sure you ring the bell and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, all of my bookish buddies, please enjoy all of the books that make you exactly who you are. 
The executive producer for Books That Make You is Desiree Duffy, produced and sound mastered by Phil Jean Grande, engineering by Dave Napox, social media and promotion by Bree Sweeter. For more, visit booksthatmakeyou.com.